Hi, I'm Carrie Schmidt, and this is Making Sense, a podcast produced by the Star Institute in an effort to further our commitment to impacting quality of life by developing and promoting best practices for sensory health and wellness through treatment, education, and research. Occupational therapy best practices ask us to integrate knowledge into practice. On this season of Making Sense, each episode offers a different conversation aimed at translating the most current research into clinical action for occupational therapy practitioners. This season of Making Sense is sponsored by Calm Strips. Calm Strips began as a small piece of blue tape wrapped on the founder's finger. He looked a bit silly wearing the tape, not to mention he had a lone sticky finger at the end of the day. So then came the idea to create something that you could stick anywhere and take everywhere, you may need a little bit of calm. Calm Strips is unwaveringly dedicated to their mission to further destigmatize the need for support and help. Calm Strips, take a bit of calm with you everywhere. I'm joined today by Dr. Courtney McDonald and Dr. Jared Kilmer. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for being here today to join us in um, the podcast, in this recording. I would love to begin um, by having you introduce yourselves. Um, Dr. McDonald, would you go first? Please? Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, I'm Dr. Courtney McDonald. Uh, thanks for having me. I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Colorado. Um, I won't for you with my educational pedigree, but um, I've worked in a lot of different um, settings, providing therapy and evaluations over the years, including forensic, residential, state treatment schools, private practice, multidisciplinary clinics. Um, I joined the Star Institute family in July of 2016. Um, and during that time, I've learned a lot about sensory processing and I've really enjoyed working collaboratively with uh, STARS families, our, our clients to support them in uh, understanding and ad addressing how sensory processing differences um, impact development, regulation, relationships, mental health, and overall wellness. Uh, currently, I contract with STAR um, on a part-time basis to provide uh, primarily assessment and evaluation services, uh, psychological and diagnostic uh, evaluations in particular, as well as some consultation, psychoeducation, and uh, parent coaching at times. That's great. Dr. Kilmer? Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Jared Kilmer. Thank you for having me here as well. Uh, I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Washington, and I serve as the director of counseling services at Game to Grow. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work in settings like children's advocacy centers and VA and private practice, but for the last few years, I have uh, my home base has been at Game to Grow. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of games of all kinds for therapeutic, educational, and community growth. So what that means in my work is I serve partly as a therapeutic game master where we use uh, games like Dungeons and Dragons to practice social skills, um, often with neurodiverse kids and adolescents, um, as well as young adults. And in my one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy, uh, I'm off, like most of my clientele is also neurodiverse, off like ADHD and autism, where we are working on um, largely self-proof and discovery and SEL related issues. That's great. It's so great to have you guys here. We are super interested in the assessment process here at STAR and always refining um, our capabilities and our understanding of what's needed. And so um, Virginia Spielman, our executive director, and I were having a conversation about the need for assessment that's neurodiversity informed, and both of your names came up. It's a topic you guys are both interested in, have personal experience with. Um, and you're both people who are um, transparent about the fact that you're learning a lot about this, um, that you're interested in the topic, that you're interested in meeting the needs of people who identify as neurodiverse. Um, and so I would just love um, to start with um, talking about 
what neurodiversity means in your work and what neurodiversity assessment, um, assessment that is neurodiversity affirmed means to you. And um, you could take that from a clinical perspective, a personal perspective. Um, yeah, I just would love to start there. That feels like a really big question. So um, I buckle in and <laughs> you don't uh, ground me as I think through this. Um, to me, um, it's been quite a process and, and journey, um, but to be neuro neurodiversity informed and affirming in my assessment work and really any work as a psychologist has meant a pretty big shift from my original graduate training, um, which for many of us as mental health therapists were trained in um, to understand human functioning, to understand diagnoses from a very medical model. Um, even though ironically, I think if I asked a lot of my mentors or professors or people who trained me, they wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, they have a lot of different answers and um, talk about being person first and, and, and human oriented and, and all of these things. Um, ironically, we were still falling into these systemic beliefs that were very ableist um, and perpetuating that as a profession. Um, and it's steeped, you know, throughout the, the educational system and um, medical system and insurance systems as well. Um, and, you know, any training program with, with their salt will have sort of a multicultural sequence, will um, push you to recognize uncomfortably your biases, your prejudice, um, your um, any racist, sexist, uh, systemic belief systems, the related social dynamics with that, uh, the social inequalities that come with diversity. But I don't remember anybody ever really talking in terms of ableism um, and the way we viewed things like diagnosis and the, dias the DSM and um, the process, the diagnostic process, which is you know, what assessment processes boil down to. So foundationally in my work, that meant transitioning away from and really abandoning um, all those things that I'd learned. Um, and, you know, you come across a lot of different barriers. It's kind of it's somewhat easier to do at face value, but then you realize the recommendations you're making um, are falling back into um, ableist beliefs and, um, of that medical model, which views differences as disorders, as deficits, um, with which, with, which is really pathologizing, um, and sees the brain body as a machine that needs to be fixed. Um, so moving away from that more into, from a medical model of disability to a social model of disability, that's more about the environment causes um, disability. It's the context. Um, and viewing neurodiversity as fact um, and as adding value to society the same way that we view biodiversity and nature as, as fact and adding value. You know, nobody's going to question the value of the diversity in the, the rainforest, um, but we are doing that with neurocognitive functioning and diversity. So um, I think that is the foundational center of, of my transition in my work and impacted the way that I did assessment from then on, from that point on. No, thank you for that perspective. And I think um, if this conversation is new to you, like what we're talking about here is that there is infant variability or variation in the neurocognitive function within our species. And what we're doing is recognizing there is diversity in human minds, right? And so that is, I hope that represents well, just a, a quick definition of, of neurodiversity. Um, but Dr. Kilmer, tell me a little bit about your experience. Uh, I'd like to, but before I get like too far, I just want to uh, praise Dr. McDonald. The way you described neurodiversity as fact, I, I realized uh, that's like a given I walk around with that's not like universally accepted or acknowledged. Um, and ironically, it comes on the heels of the thing I wanted to bring into the conversation, which is trying to be aware of when I'm making assumptions in my everyday like life 
for when I am talking to my clients and making assumptions about them and vice versa. A lot of my therapeutic work involves around like where we're identifying those things so that we can increase accuracy in our, in our language interactions. And um, if I could try to put my finger on how I would define what neurodiversity is um, outside of fact, like I'm looking at it as like, it's a difference in what, how, and how one approaches the world. It's not better or worse. It's just a, like a difference and neurotypicals or those who are neurodiverse um, that doesn't mean everything is like super easy or super hard or good or bad. There's often like pros and cons to, I think any, any way of living. Uh, my friend likes to describe uh, autism, for example, as like living in a Windows world while operating on a Linux system. Like it's not inherently worse, it's just different. And sometimes these two systems don't jive super well together, um, at least initially. Once you understand what's going on, it can be easy to work with. Um, when I think about neurodiversity informed work, like a word that comes to my mind is sensitivity, uh, as well as just perspectives, trying to, and this is again, is leveraging Dr. McDonald, uh, checking assumptions, understanding where systemic beliefs may be, and just being able to acknowledge them and work with them uh, instead of sometimes keeping our head in the sand about them or like denying that they are there, um, not assuming something is broken. So I guess like a word I would underline is like different, not better or worse. I love that perspective because what you, one thing you're both touching on is um, the value that every human brings, um, no matter what their neurocognitive function and how that interacts with the environment that they're in or the people that they're around, that they bring a value. Um, and it's a very natural, um, it's a natural thing to recognize it. And I hear that it's a very unnatural thing um, when we start challenging our assumptions about um, that value that people bring. As Dr. Kilmer saying, none of this is really my original thought, right? I, I had to borrow on, I had to go back to the place that he did in grad school with lots of other communities and diversity and sit and listen and, and be like, this isn't, research isn't following this. We aren't incorporating this um, in our diagnostic criteria, in our evaluations, in the, in the way we do assessment. We're, we're missing all these pieces. Um, and, um, you know, had so many, you know, of those moments where, you, you know, your just, mind is blown. I was like, wow, I just I never thought about this. I, this was my blind spot. Um, and so a huge piece of that was living, listening for me and my learning, um, about different neurodivergences and, and shifting the thinking of, um, diagnoses as what they are in the DSM is really pathologized neurotypes, um, is thinking of diagnoses as neurotypes, um, was listening to the lived experience of, of ADHDers, of autistic individuals, um, and learning more about, you know, these, um, sensory processing differences, um, sensory overwhelm, and, and those things were kind of a natural, um, understanding from my background at STAR, but also, you know, autistic burnout um, and meltdowns and shutdowns and camouflaging, masking, um, time blindness, um, all of these things that you aren't going to crack open um, a, a typical psych book, a medical model book and, and find. And so, um, you know, as Dr. Kilmer was talking about, we really checking those assumptions. Um, that we had and where did I get those assumptions from? You know, kind of checking my sources on that um, and having those aha moments and having a sensitivity and really incorporating the lived experience of our clients within an assessment that's meant to help them figure out their identity and who they are um, and not other them and pathologize them. So that was a, a big circular kind of aha moment for me and my learning. I love the inherent intellectual humility in that. Um, that's um, a characteristic I'm really drawn to in people as I don't know if it's as I get older or as I understand the world in a different way. 
but um, I think you're something you're both um, bringing forth is um, there are there's many ways to answer this call to action, but one of them, and maybe the start in some ways, is assuming or you know taking on some intellectual humility and starting to listen to people who have the lived experience. Um, we can't learn everything in a book. We have to learn from the people um, who experience the world differently. So. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's a characteristic I honor and I see in, in both of you. Dr. Kilmer, what's, what's your experience with that? Like, how do you personalize or take on the call to action around neurodiversity affirming or the neurodiversity movement? I think for me, it has been trying to look inward, engage in some self-reflection. Like I have a uh, my own diagnosis of autism and I uh, obtained it like later on in my adulthood, really only about a year ago. Uh, and so I spent much of my youth having autism and not being aware of it and very confident that my experiences paralleled most other people's experiences. Um, so learning more about myself, looking backwards in time, like, paying attention to like, there's a lot of moments like, oh, 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 okay. Um, from childhood, um, I also try to just compare notes. Be we're all gonna have a, an individualized and unique experience, but trying to just listen to others who uh, might be categorized with the same diagnosis, for example, they are not gonna have the same experiences as me. And so for me to have an awareness that uh, one label doesn't encapsulate a single experience has been really, really important. Um, just diversifying my like portfolio of knowledge in that area. If it's not too personal, would you talk a little bit about the assessment process in that led you to your diagnosis? Like how, how was that experience? Is there anything that we as practitioners could learn from your experience? I'm not sure what we could learn, but um, I am conf like, I'm I am happy to talk about that. Uh, it was my, my experience as a clinical psychologist was I wasn't like even fully aware of what autism was until the end of my training. My training program didn't focus on neurodiversity as much as I think it could have. Um, uh, so I, I moved through my training, not really understanding it till near the tail end. And then as I, uh, I'm a doctor, I'm in a like healthy, stable relationship. I'm starting to learn more about it. I'm starting to like, just laugh at myself if I, as I notice like traits, uh, in my home life, uh, but that's probably not autism. Um, and the, then like this, the, the, the evidence starts piling up, uh, and then it, it shifts from a joke to a confidence um in my household uh and that it, it sits there for a really long time until i uh my work with autistic youth um grows significantly at a certain point in my career and i have lots of clients who describe their own experiences or you know frustrations they're having interpersonally or at school and they really resonate with me and they feel very familiar and I'll be able to like hear them and echo it back in a way that they would respond as it was very validating. I appreciate you wording it that way. How did you learn about that? Like how many books did you read? And I'm laughing kind of internally because uh, not enough at this time in my life. This is mostly just me noticing my own experiences and echoing them back to my client. Um, and that process like further confirms I should probably look into this more formally. Um, and so there was a certain point where I'm walking around confident of my diagnosis, but don't want to publicly point to it because it's uh, just me engaging in self-diagnosis, which is valid. Um, but uh, because I, I perceive some people would not accept that at face value, I also wanted uh, the little extra defense of a third party verifying that. Um, when I, I was so terrified to go to that assessment too, because I knew what was going to happen is I'd sit down and they'd say, 
explain to me why you think you're autistic and they like put all the pressure on me um which is exactly what happened it wasn't it really wasn't that bad um <laughs> we had all the evidence but and i don't know how normal that is um i would not want to put my client through that i think i'd want to ease them into that conversation a little bit more and bless their heart i think my my psychologist psychologist did try to do that we were talking uh just, it felt like small talk and then it was gathering some basic information about me and like 15 minutes passed and I'm realizing the assessment started 15 minutes ago. They just didn't tell me. Um, but uh, we, it was a pretty brief assessment process. I think I was in and out of the room in under four hours. Um, I have a, I had a unusual situation and that I am a clinical psychologist. So I am very familiar with many psychological assessments, which I think made it difficult to give me like the broadest battery that my doctor would have preferred to give me. So um, it was a more of a very in-depth clinical interview, collateral information from my wife and family, uh, some self-report measures like the PAI and the RADS. Uh, and, and that was about it, to be honest. Does that process or the, anything about that assessment kind of uh, strike you, Dr. McDonald? Oh, there's so many things that strike me. Um, so, you know, you know, first and foremost, going back to, I even wrote down what Dr. Kilmer said. I, you know, love quotes, but when he said one label doesn't encapsulate a single person um, and, you know, a big, uh, a big motto in, in the neurodivergent and autistic community is if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. So um, when you're trying to kind of look at a cluster of things, but also look at just the natural variation that is, is typical of anyone, right? You're looking at a, a profile of, of strengths, of, of differences and vulnerabilities is kind of how I try to go into it. And um, realizing that the DSM has so many flaws, which I think most mental health professionals would agree with, um, but it's very pathologizing, uh, uses very pathologizing language, is very limited, doesn't incorporate many of the lived experiences um, of autistic individuals as criteria created by neurotypical individuals and neurotypical research. And, and because of that, a lot of the assessments that we have um, are meant to say whether or not they're, they're encapsulating, they're pinging, they're checking the boxes of the DSM. So they're based on DSM criteria. So we keep falling into this trap. Um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, seeing what other people were using, what, what isn't a DSM based, um, assessment, um, you know, and straddling that line of, I want this to be a diagnosis that's going to hold up and no one's going to question, but also realizing all the, the faults of the way we do it and how to do it better. Um, and so when Dr. Kimmler was talking about his experience, I even was like, oh, I think I fall into that trap. Every single time I do an assessment, I, I learn um, from my clients and try to, um, one, build it based on my client, um, you know, how many hours they have, if they already have self-diagnosed themselves um, and as autistic or ADHD or, or whatever we're looking at um, and uh, utilize that time. But I, I realized when, you know, Dr. Kilmer, you were saying, Ooh, I don't know if I would ease my client into that. I was thinking about, Oh man, all the way back to our intake processes, where I think on intakes, some of the questions are very direct, right? Their clients are typing this out on our cover sheets or, or whatever. Why do you, you know, what do you suspect? What diagnoses do you expect? Why do you think, you know, you are autistic? Um, and, not realizing how confrontative that could even be. Um, so it's, um, you know, like, how can we do that better? Um, one thing I was thinking about, and I've, I've you know, one of uh, a neurodivergent psychologist that I've gleaned a lot from, and I can, I can source later when we're talking about that, but um, 
I remember, you know, him talking about his batteries and sort of challenging other psychologists of why are we doing so many tests? Um, that there's sort of this ableist belief that balloons are assessments and that I was very taught as as an assessment purist of we have to rule everything out in order to rule things in. Um, And that in particular, and I've seen it more and more as I've been reading, you know, my own old reports or um, reports from other professionals of they're trying to explain autism or ADHD or another diagnosis away. and being like, no, it's, it's due to this. Um, and, you know, kind of drilling down on what that's from, is that from a place of, you know, pathology, um, of seeing certain value in certain diagnoses and not the others, that this is the safer thing that's gonna land better with a person or their caregivers. Um, are we talking ourselves out of it because of, a, you know, ableist beliefs? Um, so that's really affected the, you know, the, the assessments and the amount of time that I put my client through, um, I don't want to come across like I'm trying to prove them wrong, right? I want to help collaborative. I want it to be collaborative and I want us to explore um, the person's profile and neurotype together and then decide if that's a, a larger umbrella neurotype um, for the neurodivergences that they're describing um, and have it be an identity um, and not so much a, a you know, a, a label. Um, so um, I don't always, you know, I don't think cognitive, te- you know, cognitive testing is not diagnostic, but so many of us do it. Um, and unless there's a reason to, they need, you know, we're looking at processing speed for an accommodation. Why are we testing, you know, um, cognitive abilities when it's not diagnostic of of ADHD it's not diagnostic of of autism it's not diagnostic of of much except these very certain things um so if that's not the referral question why are we doing it so I always try to uh question um why I'm I'm choosing a certain assessment and I do rely a lot on interviewing um a lot and um going away from some of the things that were maybe seen as the gold standard for the insurance companies um, to things that are more um, exploratory and and are going to give people an opportunity to tell me about themselves and the way they process information and the way they process sensory input and and things like that. If I could jump on a little bit of that, I, I, I fully agree with you on how clinical interview focused your assessments are. I think that one of the reasons certain uh, assessment measures are seen as a gold standard is that they have been very finely tuned to be standardized and we can trust that, like, we don't need to trust the assessor. We can trust the tool to make sure we cover everything. Um, But that doesn't leave a lot of extra wiggle room. And if the assessor is competent and has that knowledge background, they know where to deviate and like dig a little bit deeper to gather that information that at the end of the day should reflect the same diagnostic criteria plus more information. Um, And I was also like really excited about you talking about rule outs and rule ins and explaining away certain diagnoses. Uh, There's this implication. It's not really said. It's just kind of what I walk away with that certain diagnoses are seen as safer or more acceptable or approachable. I would rather be diagnosed with autism than say depression or anxiety, Um, just in my own personal experience of depression and anxiety. Um, The way I am by default, it really isn't that bad. I quite like it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I love that you're both um, hitting on something that is Um, super important. And I think that is listening to the lived experience of the individual. Um, And you're both approaching that with um, collaborative intent. Um, And, and, um, and as Dr. McDonald said, um, really considering the underlying identity of the person, not just answers on a sheet of paper that are standardized, right? And are gonna give us some piece of information. Um, 
I'm so interested in this topic. I know so many people that are listening are so interested in this topic. So I would love to hear you both speak to what resources you find super helpful, whether it's voices in the neurodivergent community, whether um, it's some resources that you've been able to find through social media or online. If somebody is interested in um, looking more into this, whether they are a clinical psychologist, an occupational therapist, some other type of clinician, kind of give us some resources, point us in the right direction. Um, where, where should we start? Well, so I think the, the, the best place I can direct people to, which was my kind of holy grail um, learning ground was um, the uh, neurodiversity affirming therapist Facebook group. So I kind of found that by joining a more uh, a, a Facebook group for psychologists who were doing psychological evaluations because I was trying to tap into how you know, are people doing um, autism, adult autism um, evaluations? And there weren't, I didn't know anyone doing them originally. Um, and there weren't really many people in my community doing them. And I didn't personally have any sources for it. And I remember having um, some time, somewhere along the same timeline, a conversation with our clinical director, executive director, Virginia Spielman, and she, and talking about, you know, learning about neurodivergence from, you know, individuals in the community and communities. And she's like, you have to go on social media. You have to get on Twitter. You have to join these things. And I had, I had given those things up personally for my own mental health. And so I was sort of like, oh, I don't want to go back there. Um, it's a big dark hole. Um, but professionally, it, it feels a lot different. Um, well, most of the time. Um, so, you know, I started following certain hashtags, um, you know, star at the time was, was hiring, um, consultants in regards to neurodivergence and inclusivity and diversity. And, um, I was getting resources from them. And, um, one of the loudest voices on sort of this testing psychologist group, um, in, in regards to neurodiversity was Dr. Joel Schwartz, who is a neurodivergent psychologist, um, in California. And he kept pressing people and, and getting them to think about the way they were thinking about things and, and what they were recommending and how they were doing their evaluations. And it just made sense to me. And so he created his own group, the, the Neurodiversity Affirming Therapist Group, and got neurodivergent moderators. And it's a community that welcomes um, both uh, you know, neurotypical um, providers, OTs, SLPs, PTs, um, health and wellness providers, uh, mental health providers, and uh, neurodivergent providers who are, you know, willing to offer some spoons um, to talk about these different experiences and topics and the way that we're providing therapy and assessment. Um, and it's a really large group now. Um, it's, I, I want to say it's over 10,000 people now um, and, and has grown and grown and grown. Um, and so, you know, if this is a great place to sit and listen um, to the experiences of others um, and really specific to our fields um, and find answers for questions, find consultation um, and resources and recommendations. So, you know, I'd say that is invaluable. Some of the things I use in my assessments. Matt Lowry is an autistic psychologist from Kentucky, I believe, and he published this post, this beautiful post about reframing the DSM um, in, in non-pathologizing language and better yet, you know, looking at different lived experiences. And I mean, I could go on and on about these different things that I, I just incorporated and I use um, in my thinking, in my assessment work. Um, and have found accounts from all these different professionals um, from that that I, I follow. And I, when I do my streaming and my scanning, it's usually that. I'm usually downloading those things throughout the day um, to think about and continue to evolve um, in my work. So I'd say that is one of my, my number ones. Um, Dr. Joel Schwartz also put out a you know, for people interested in CUs, I took it, um, you know, it's really rare to find these things through the Chicago School of Professional 
psychologists, a neurodiversity kind of 101, quote unquote, training. Um, and um, I would advocate for people to check out the MIGDAS, the M-I-G-D-A-S, which is um, an assessment that is very sensory based. It's very interview based. It's very, um, it can be multidisciplinary. Um, getting on the knowledge from OTs, SLPs, you might know, um, in looking at specifically autism, um, but is a really good replacement for the ADOS um, and kind of getting away from the pathologizing nature of the ADOS and the ADOS misses a lot um, of individuals because of masking and camouflaging and doesn't take those things into account. So, um, you know, you'll find a lot of non-standardized, quote unquote, um, assessments that will help you create conversations around different lived experiences. Thank you. I will um, also make sure that in our show notes, we reference all of this and get give people links. So um, if you're listening and um, moving about, you know, come back, check out the show notes and, and we'll link a lot of these places. How about you, Dr. Kilmer? Where have you found um, good resourcing? Well, I, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm a little bit embarrassed. I think Dr. McDonald nailed it. So I do want to echo the like neurodiversity affirming Facebook group is a good place to check out. Um, I, in a different context, I would have pointed at the Star Institute and it feels redundant in this moment, um, but I do want to give you all a shout out. I, I also, if you can find a trustworthy uh, like content creator on YouTube, it's not the most academic place to, to go to learn, but it also can be a fantastic springboard and start place for many, especially if you are a, a professional just learning about a topic or you are a lay person and want to like ha have more of a language around a construct. I am a, the, the name of a good channel for autism, I, I escapes me in the moment. So I don't want to cite something incorrectly, but how to ADHD uh, is a YouTube channel that I uh, talk about all the time as very well researched and great content by someone who is not trained as an academic, but has done a lot of their work as a lay person to consume and uh, turn this information back around for the general public. That's super helpful. I will definitely add that link as well. So thank you. Um, so I wanna wrap up, even though I think we could talk about this um, for much longer than we have so far, but um, at the end of every podcast in the series, I love to ask each of our guests um, the same question. And that is, at STAR, we have a really high value on curiosity um, and evolving and thinking, um, evolving our thinking as science and society evolve. Um, so that means sometimes we have to change our minds about something. Sometimes we have to admit that our thinking has evolved on a topic. And so I would love to hear each of you say, what's one thing that you once believed that you've either, either changed your mind about or that your thinking has evolved about? So. Um, I'm not sure who wants to start. <laughs> I could go. Um, I uh, I used to walk around confidently thinking that the DSM is good enough. And I will defend it. I think it's a good thing. I don't want to burn it or get rid of it. But I also think that it is, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. Um, I'd like to see it enhanced and evolve and... Uh, they not have an inherent assumption around pathology. I think even that is a necessity to some degree. Um, it, neurodiversity isn't just differences. There are some difficulties that come with it. And I, I feel validated and I appreciate that as acknowledged um, in that text, but it doesn't really give enough to those lived experiences. And uh, my, I guess my thinking around the DSM is evolving in that we collectively and, and, and personally, myself, I want to do more to see that, that shift in our culture and in our field towards something more inclusive and affirming. Yeah, amen to that. Um, 
that mine feels really simplistic, but kind of going back to, you know, what we first started um, talking about and how my framework thinking perspective has evolved. It's such a, it seems like a simple thing, but it's so loaded and it's so, it has carries so much meaning with the, the, when we're talking about the language we use, um, and I was talking about, you know, learning from a medical model without people necessarily even thinking they're teaching from a medical model. I remember a conversation that was happening between me and when I was a student and a, a student who's in a program at a different university and a counseling program, and I was in a clinical psychology program. And without knowing my degree, what I was, what I was in school for, she was saying, well, psychologists um, are very medical model. They, they use the term autistic um, to reference clients and that's very pathologizing. It's very degrading. Um, you know, we as counselors are, are trained to use the word person with autism. Um, and so what, you know, she was talking about was person first language, which is actually what we were taught in my program. So I, you know, I corrected her and I was like, no, we use person first language. We were taught to respect a person's personhood, their person first and all these other, other you know, things are parts of a whole, a whole person and humanhood. And um, so when, you know, I started following different neurodivergent accounts and autistic individuals accounts, and they're like a vast majority. And of course you always defer to a person's own, how they identify in their own language about themselves, but a vast majority of, of individuals, you know, uh, uh, autistic individuals were like, we prefer the word autistic individual. It's my identity. I prefer identity first language. And that just like rotated my mind in so many different directions of like, here we were thought we were being so um, advanced and respectful and, and thinking of the person first when the person was saying, I am autistic. This is my lens. This is my perspective. I'm, this is how I make meaning of the world and you're demeaning it by not acknowledging it. Um, and we've heard this from a lot of different groups of people and, you know, like why we hadn't considered that. So that um, is something I've, I've fully changed my mind on um, and listened to. And I just remember it being a complete mind twist at the time of like, wow, <laughs> with the traps we've fallen, fallen into. Um, so um, that's one of the the things that came to my mind first. If I could comment on that before we run out of time. I, I think it's a, like an understandable trap to fall into. Um, like from the perspective of a person with say like depression, mm -hmm. d describing it that way can imply that that person can uh, absolve themselves of that depression and go on and still be them. Uh, if I lost my autism, and I don't know what that means, but also I, I wouldn't be myself and I don't know what that means. It, it, it's, a, it's a catastrophic difference um, in that context. Yeah. Thank you both. I wanna thank you for being here today. I wanna to thank you for your transparency and vulnerability and sharing your lived experiences with us. And thank you for intellectual humility and how you're approaching and learning your own lessons along the way. I think what you have learned thus far is gonna help everybody out there listening um, to explore um, what they're learning and where they can go next with it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you um, for your honesty and um, really thank you for being here today. You can find me, Carrie Schmidt, on Instagram, at Carrie Schmidt OTD. That's C A R R I E S C H M I T T O T D. The Star Institute is a nonprofit organization. You can find out more about us at our website, sensoryhealth.org. That's www.sensoryhealth.org. There you can join our email list, find out about our educational, clinical, and research endeavors and make a donation.
This podcast wouldn't be possible without our wonderful guests and the support from the Star Institute, especially Crystal Hayes and Tori Pluchek. Your feedback matters to us. Please leave a review, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. This is Making Sense. I'm Carrie Schmidt.